Stephen Willis. How would you explain the concept of make it go right? I've been a Scientology watcher for several years and I've consumed hundreds of hours of N theta at this point, but while I feel I have a good grasp of what make it go right means, I don't think I could effectively explain it. What's the best description you can come up with? Thanks for the question, Stephen, and also thank you for your patronage. <laughs> um, okay, so make it go right. Uh, that is the way. Make it go right and win the day. That is a little uh, 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 the chorus from the song Make It Go Right that L. Ron Hubbard wrote that they uh, sing on, on the Road to Freedom album. And Make It Go Right is something that L. Ron Hubbard described as the supreme test of a thetan. Is, uh, and a thetan, of course, being a spiritual entity in Scientology. You, who you truly and really are, is a thetan, not your body. And so the supreme test of a thetan is his ability to make things go right. Um, and so in Scientology, and especially in the Sea Org, this is a very valued trait. And it's basically about, well, there's another term in Scientology which might, uh, th is the best way I can communicate about this, and that term is necessity level. Uh, it's Hubbard's way of, of communicating the, the, you know, driving, picking your, not only picking yourself up by your bootstraps or kicking yourself in the butt, but necessity level is all about survival and the point where this sort of a tipping point where you, um, you know, you raise your necessity level, you raise, you, you're, you're confronted with a situation in life, you're confronted with some problem, whether it be at work or a personal problem, and you have to deal with it. You simply don't have a choice. Failure is not an option, you know, is, an, is, an, is a common English expression for the sort of sense or feeling of what raising your necessity level is. And that is something you have to do in order to make it go right. You know, making it go right is sort of the ultimate expression of pulling something off, no matter how impossible or how unlikely or how improbable or, you know, it, it could possibly be. Just ignoring all of those barriers, uh, what they call the you know messed universe barriers, the matter, energy, space, time, the physical universe. In Scientology, it's called the messed universe. And ignoring any barriers from the, from the messed universe and making something happen anyway. Now, the theory behind this, the ultimate sort of theory behind this uh, in Scientology is that you as a spiritual being are immortal. You have been around for a nearly infinite amount of time in the past, and you will continue to exist a near infinite or infinite amount of time into the future. During that time, the physical universe has been something that you have occupied, you've been involved in, you've had you know, millions and trillions of, of, of lives, uh, lives, I should say, bodies. And during that time, uh, or, or rather I should say, um, your existence here in the physical universe is sort of viewed in Scientology as, uh, as this is like a playground. This is a place where, you, where you're, not now it's not, you've, you've devolved down over the trillennia into this degraded state where you think you are a body. And that's like a kid playing with dolls who says one day, I am the Ken doll or the Barbie doll. You'd look at him and go, what? That's crazy. Well, that's, that's how Hubbard describes us having bodies is, you know, I'm, I'm, this is me, this is who I am. And Hubbard goes, no, you're not. You're this immortal spiritual being. And so the, the, the whole existence of the physical universe is only a reality because we make it a reality through our will, through our intention. We want it to be that way, and so therefore it is. So the theory behind making something go right is that you've always had the ability and uh, superpower, I guess you could say, to bend the forces of the physical universe to your will. Uh, because you're the one who's actually creating all of this. And if for anybody who's ever read uh, Richard Bachman, uh, or Richard Bach, rather, I should say, the Jonathan Livingston Siegel, or Illusions, uh, you know, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. These are, these are uh, books Scientologists love, and, and, and I learned about these very early on. Um, because they pattern themselves after this whole, the same theory, that, that everything you see is an illusion, and, and everything around you is just there because you think it's there. It's not real. You're real. But everything else is just sort of a, you know, has about as much reality and, and should be taken as seriously as a, as a dream or a movie. So, um, so that is why in Scientology, and again, especially in the Sea Org, 
you are given tasks to perform or carry out or targets to achieve or accomplish and there's no quibbling about it. You are simply to make it go right to pull off whatever it is that's being demanded of you with no, ex you know, no excuses, no justifications or rationalizations as to why that's not possible. And um, I think, you know, this is kind of funny, but it's, it's the first thing that popped to mind when I read this question. So I'll give it to you as an example of, of what I'm talking about in the real world. I mean, this is going to be a, this is going to be a silly example. You're going to look at the, you're going to think about this and go, well, that's kind of silly. But at the time, this was kind of an all consuming problem for me. I was at a conference. Uh, there were senior Scientology executives putting on this recruitment conference. This was early on in my Sea Org career, probably the first or second year I was, I, I think it was within the first year of me being a Sea Org member. And so, you know, I was very, you know, oh my God, there's all these senior people around, not David Miscavige, but other middle management, higher executives. And um, we had staff from the various churches around the West U.S. there. And uh, the one of the executives, oh yeah, I think it was the executive director international, who at the time was a big wig, now he's just... Uh, Guillaume Lesev, he's a French guy, now he's like in the hole or something, but at the time he was a bigwig, and he wanted, okay, like I said, this is going to sound silly, but he wanted an orange juice. We didn't have any orange juice. We didn't have any budget for any orange juice. We didn't have any accommodations for any orange juice. The hotel that we were putting the convention on at didn't have any orange juice. Yet, here was this senior, senior Scientology executive who wanted some orange juice. And he was one of, doing the speaking at the conference. I was just one of the guys running logistics and, and making things go right to you know, set things up, get copies of surveys, put things together, you know, set up the chairs and tables. I mean, we were doing that kind of grunt work. And so this, uh, you know, this assistant to the executive director international comes to me and says, he wants this orange juice. And I'm like, well, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have any. I don't know how to get any. And I come back with this because I go, oh, okay. I didn't have any money, you know? And uh, so I didn't know what to do. And I ran around the hotel. They didn't have any. I came back to this executive and I looked at her and I just said, I, 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 I can't get any orange juice. There just isn't any around. And she just looked at me and she said, and I'm supposed to tell him that he can't have any orange juice because you couldn't make it go right? And I was like, no, sir. And I, you know, good. Well, then go, you know. And this was, this was to me at that moment in time with my resources and availability of orange juice, I was screwed. And we were miles from the, the pack base, so I couldn't just go to the galley or just rip one off from the canteen. We were out at a hotel. So, um, you know, my other Sea Org, my other fellow Sea Org members didn't have any money. This woman who was giving me the order didn't have any money. And, uh, and I was really stuck on what to do. I had no idea how to make this go right. Um, and as best I recall, I did finally get a glass of orange juice um, because I ended up, I went to the front counter and they didn't have anything. I went to the, the little store that, you know, hotels will sometimes have for their guests. They didn't have anything. But I finally wandered all the way back around where I wasn't supposed to go into the kitchen area and, um, and there was some orange juice there. And I got a glass and I uh, took it back to the guy. And I was told from the front desk and by you know, people I was asking that there wasn't any. So I just you know, sort of surreptitiously took this glass of orange juice and I took it over there and I got it. And you know, I didn't even get hardly much of a thank you, but that, that happened. And I wouldn't, of course, have been as desperate. I wouldn't, have, I mean, I was literally sweating to, to try to get this, right? Again, totally stupid, very, very silly um, example. But it was the first time that, it, that I was in the Sea Org where somebody gave me what was basically an impossible task, seemingly, and I had to raise my necessity level and I had to pass this supreme test and I had to go get this class of orange juice. And I pulled that off. And, um, and of course, you know, with the Scientology terminology and belief system, I said, I just, you know, pulled it in. I just found this, you know, this, this, this glass out of nowhere. I just made it go right. And that is sort of the spirit of the thing when they say that in Scientology is you're just supposed to make that happen. So long explanation and story for a fairly simple concept, but I hope that gets across not only what it means and why people believe it, that it's an important thing in Scientology, but how it actually expresses itself in day-to-day Sea-Org life too. So there you go.